<laughs> I'm from, uh, I was born in Abingdon, Virginia. I don't know if anybody knows where Abingdon is. It's down, down on the border with Bristol, Tennessee and so forth, right? It's down that way. And I was, we came here when I was five, right? And I moved into the household on uh, 15th and Piers, right, when I was like four years old. <laughs> and um, it was interesting. It was, uh, well, the neighborhood was predominantly white. We were the first blacks to move on that block. Oh, really? Yes, we were. Yeah. <laughs> well, didn't you say you knew that, well, with Johnson's house? Right. That was where the, uh, back, in, back in the day, that was where the uh, black and white uh, line, oh. imaginary line, went right up 15th Street. So Dr. Johnson's house was the last black house on the block. Then the next house was supposed to be, um, was supposed to be white. And my father, who was extremely light-skinned, <laughs> told me one time, he said that um, if I had to go to the bathroom 20 minutes earlier when he bought that house, we wouldn't have gotten it. And I kept wondering, what he meant by that? What did he mean by that? Okay, well, naturally they were trying to, you know, my father went in and bought the house since he was, he was lighter than you were. <laughs> and uh, my mom was real dark skin, like Wesley Snipes dark skin, you know. And uh, what happened was, he was going to get the house, because they liked it, it was cool. They wanted it, that house, and didn't want the real estate agents to see mom and me. So we stayed out in the car about a block away. I had to go to the bathroom. Before my mom could stop me, I bolted out of the back door and was running down the street and went in the real estate office and said, Dad! I gotta go to the bathroom. And the real estate agent was, but it was too late. The papers had already been oh, signed. <laughs> yeah, that's it. So we moved into that house, and mom was kind of scared to have me even go out in the yard and play, you know, whatever. But it, it worked out okay, and I still own the house. I haven't rented out, of course. Mom and dad are deceased, and I haven't rented out now, but I still have the. I don't want to get rid of it because it's got memories of the radio station and other things and whatever as far as that's concerned. I can go over there and see my room anytime I want to, you know. <laughs> Did you get any harassment from the neighbors? Kind of. The lady across the street in Miss um, uh, Purdue's whole house, well, she still lives at Purdue's movie right now. Her name was Miss Bell. She, Dr. Bell's widow offered my father twice as much as he paid for the house to move out, and he wouldn't take it. Yeah, because back in the day, I think the house went for like $4,000 or something. And <laughs> yeah. that was that in the 40s? This was 1955. 1955. Mm, 1955, right, right. But it wasn't all that much house. We had, uh, you know, neighbors in the background. In fact, uh, one of our neighbors, I used to go see at uh, Guggenheim Nursing Home, Miss Matthew, was on 15th Street. She was real nice and everything, and she recently passed. And uh, the houses are still there. Miss Purdue's house, you know, all of them are still there and so forth. But it's a predominantly black neighborhood now. Yeah. Right, right. Well, do you remember Dr. Uh, Johnson at all? Yeah, of course. Uh, no, Dr. Johnson was a famous guy in the neighborhood. Because yeah. he had Arthur Ashe and Althea Gibson back around 1960. They used to come to Lynchburg from uh, Richmond in D.C., I believe, and practice on his tennis court. Which is a shame the way that place looks now. Yeah. Doc would come back and shoot somebody if he saw his house. <laughs> but anyway, uh, he had a beautiful tennis court, ro rolled asphalt, gravel, lines, net, everything, bleachers, everything. Like a professional tennis court up there. And we used to sneak up in Doc's bushes and watch uh, Arthur Ashe and all of them play tennis. He'd see us over there and he'd, y'all get out of there. And we'd run home, you know, and so forth. But uh, he ran a little. Summer camp for tennis stars. Paul and Juan Farrell were there, and a lot of the famous folks, you know, and of course Althea went on to do Wimbledon and a lot of yes. other places and so forth. But we saw her when she was first starting. <laughs> yes. Did you mix with them at all, or did you just. Talk Not really. Doc, Doc was in his own category or whatever, yeah. you know, we were just the neighbors and so forth, you know, but Doc was Doc, was Doc and he was in the upper echelon crew and so forth. And I don't know, it was just. One of those things, you know. Yeah. My doctor was Dr. Bowell. <laughs> yeah. No, that was Dr. Bowell and Dr. Wesley. Dr. Bowell, Dr. Wesley, and Dr. Johnson were the only black physicians in the in the area at the time. And so forth. But anyway, so but Doc and eventually across the street he had uh, Elmer Reed, you might know Elmer Reed and Ethel Reed and all of them. They they played tennis and so forth. And that was my good buddy, so I got to sit up on the bleachers and watch him sometimes. So it worked out fine.
when you grew up, you never went to an integrated school, right? No, ma'am, I didn't have that opportunity. I don't know if it was an opportunity or not, but I, my class, at the, I went to Payne School from the second through the seventh grade. My mom taught me in the first grade, believe it or not, at an old two-room school called Kingston, which is in Campbell County. I have that on my website, too. Kingston School. And uh, in high school, we went to Dunbar High School, and I graduated 69. And the last class before integration was 70. So I was the next to the last class. And what, what kind of experiences did you have in school? Was it good well, experiences, or were you... You know, there was always that line where you didn't, you know, we didn't go to glass and they didn't go over here. It was a line between that and so forth. The ironic thing was uh, when Mr. C retired, our black principal we had for so long, uh, Mr. LaRue, who was a white guy, <laughs> he came in and he was principal of Dunbar for two years. And we thought the whole world was going to collapse. Oh my God, Dunbar's got a white principal. Oh my goodness, you know. So for our last year, we had a white principal at Dunbar. And he turned out to be the best, I mean, he had us, he let us have a student lounge and a lot of things that weren't unheard of back then. We had a senior lounge. He let us, if y'all want to build it, y'all go ahead and build it. We put a sofa in and everything, and our senior lounge and everything. And he turned out to be okay. Well, that was good because C was part of that figure. I mean, oh, he C, was yeah, Mr. C vice was, mayor, he was yeah, everything. Mr. C was something else, but he was real, I, I won't say set in his ways, but he was just set. He didn't want to. You want everything to stay just just as it is, so forth. You know, we came in. Can we have a senior? Yeah, sure. Let's let's build it. You know, Pauline Maloney. Do you remember her? Oh, of course. Yeah, we call her Miss Wheaton. Yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. She's on the painting too. Yep. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. she was quite a strong character. Oh yeah, most definitely. Uh, she was my uh, assistant principal when I was there. Yeah, I definitely remember her. And everybody lived in the neighborhood. See, we lived at 15th and Pierce. Miss Wheaton lived at uh, 14th and Buckhannon. Mm -hmm. Mr. C was at 13th and Pierce. So all of the teachers and everything kind of lived in that little, you know, nutshell and so forth, right there in the area. So you would watch day and night, pretty much. Yeah, well. that's not most definitely. I couldn't do anything else. Miss Mead up the street, my third grade teacher, who she lived at 13th and Pierce, would be out walking her dog, looking at me and saying. Yeah, I'm gonna get you to school the next day. <laughs> yeah, everybody lived right in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Everybody. I think we've lost a lot of that now. Yeah, no kidding. Kids, the kids don't. I go in the neighborhood now. I don't know anybody. Mm -hmm. You know, I did be way one of the who. You know, who is that? Oh, this man. Like, he owns that. Oh, okay. <laughs> and pe people used to um, look out for each other's kids. I think. Oh yeah, uh, we had a neighborhood mom, of course we had a couple of moms that didn't work. My parents were both school teachers, so they were gone all day and, you know, back in the evening. We had neighborhood moms that didn't, you know, like to say, for instance, uh, Ms. Reed, that was Donna Reed's uh, uh, mom. And she would, uh, you know, kind of take care of us, give us snacks and make sure we didn't beat each other up and so forth, you know. And we had, uh, of course, I, I grew up... Uh, Near uh, Julius Haskins too. Yeah. Now Julius used to go on um, the Arthur Ash I mean, um, Doctor um, Johnson's uh, tennis court too. Right. Right. Know. Right. Now Julius was uh, Julius lived at uh, 16th in Buckhannon. So he lived two blocks from me. Mm -hmm. And I was hanging out with his brother Ryan, who was a lot younger. Okay, so, you know, all of us, like I said, were in the same neighborhood and you know grew up together. What was Julius like as a boy? I didn't really know him because I hung out with his brothers and his oh. younger brothers and so forth. But uh, yeah, I really did not know him until he got into his profession. Yeah. Right, right. Because we'll, we'll be talking about him also later with other people. Okay. Uh, Claudette, but uh, I didn't know if you had a perspective on Right, him. no, not particularly. So did you play sports at all? <laughs> no, ma'am. I, uh, I was a spectator, you might say. No, mm -hmm. I couldn't do anything. All the guys were basketball and all this other stuff, whatever. No, that wasn't my thing. I was into, I was into the books. Uh -huh. I was into physics and so forth. You know, I won uh, first place in the district at Dunbar. Oh. Yeah, and for? taking taking the test for physics. Physics. That was my thing. Yeah, I could do physics and calculus and so forth. But I was almost flunking physical education. <laughs> 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 Wasn't too good at gym, man. Mm -hmm. Right. But um. You know, we're coming to the time when you um, did the uh, did the radio station. The radio station. Which is the reason you're on the thing. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, great uh, man. Like, oh my goodness. <laughs> oh my goodness, Mr. Stamps. How you doing? Yeah, those were. Those when were I first heard of 
heard about it, I went around the street to the store. Mm -hmm. And they said, man, what are you doing around here? Um, lad. Um, said, this is when lad is on there. <laughs> it, it's, it's when lad is on there. And lad had that had an um, operation. <laughs> I mean, that was out of sight. But he had parents that were so good, they let him be creative. Um, so I, this was when he already had the thing up and running? In other words, Lad's father was an educator. Mm -hmm. And he was always real, real smart. But they knew he was doing something with all those gadgets and things. And the kids started talking around the school. And everybody was talking about a lad show. Now remember, when he was doing this, Dick Clark and all those people were in that heyday. Mm -hmm. And kids would rush home before lad started doing what he was doing and watch them. So he changed the the cultural... The complexion. Yes. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> when mm -hmm. I first heard this, all you got to do, what was it, lad, that you could do to hook up into you? No, you just tuned to 630 on the uh -huh. dial. Yeah, it was. <laughs> now, what did you have to did you have, talk about how you... Because right, you were talking about... Did the FCC ever get your name? Yeah, <laughs> I got, in fact, I got the whole story on my website, you know, about the radio station. See, what happened back in the day, like, you know, all we had to listen to in Lynchburg was... Uh, you know, it was uh, WLL, they were rock and roll, and WWOD and Night, they were, they were rock and roll. And, you know, we had to wait on a black song to come on. And, like, when the Supremes come on, you know, you hear the Beatles, Dave Clark Five, and hear the Supremes. We get on the phone, hey, quick, cut the radio on. The Supremes song, and by the time you would call three people, the song is over. <laughs> it was that, you know. <laughs> yeah, so, so I grew up with uh, Johnny Get Angry, Johnny Get Mad, and you know, all of this stuff like that, because we didn't know any better. We just thought that that was the end music and whatever. And it, was, it wasn't until, um, and we had another guy who was on, but we didn't know he was on because he was beyond my bedtime. That's what I was telling you about earlier. And that's the gentleman right here, which I brought a picture of. Uh, John R., way down south in Dixie. <laughs> <laughs> this is the guy that used, we used to listen to at night, but he didn't come on until 10 o'clock. Which was bedtime. Yeah, that's right. Usually, you know, you had to go to bed at 10 o'clock. And uh, this guy right here, John R., which is a white guy, which not too many people knew that because he sounded, he would talk his stuff and whatever, and we swore him down he was a black guy. But he was a white guy, and he was playing for this record shop down and everything, and he would just uh, come on. And, out of Tennessee. Out of Nashville, Tennessee. John R., way down south in Dixie. All right, here's James Brown now. And you swore him that he sounded it. And he said a lot of people would come up and said, you know, I'm looking for John R. And he said, okay, well, you found him. You? <laughs> right, so, and, so we didn't, I didn't really know about him. And the other guy, which is right here, this is uh, the horse man who was always down for wrong crown. You remember that? Oh, the yeah. horse man, down for wrong crown, right here on WLAC. And he was on after John R. went off. He was another white guy. And yeah. we were just amazed that, you know, that, that he was a white guy. He was a white guy. He was a white guy. He does. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And um, so this was great, but uh, I didn't know that there was such thing as a soul station until I went to Chicago. And uh, my cousin said, you got this now station because y'all in Lynchburg they ain't got one. I said, what is this? You know, so I cut the radio on. And WB win, which stood for the voice of the Negro. And they was playing Temptations and the Four Tops and the Five Stair Steps and I didn't hear no Beatles. I said, oh, wow. It's not that I had anything against them. It's the fact that we want to hear our kind of music sometime, right. you know? So recently, I found this um, album on eBay, and I won it. And I wanted to bring this to you. I don't know if you can zoom in on that or not. But this is, a, this is the station in Chicago that my cousin had me listen to, which was a little 1,000-watt station. And this is the original Mad Lad. <laughs> wow. His name was... Like, uh, cause when I went to Chicago, I took my, I took my tape recorder and I taped everything that they did. I just taped and I brought it back. I said, y'all ain't gonna believe this. 
Listen to this. Here's a station that ain't playing the Dave Clark Five. And they were just amazed at it. And uh, I said, well, maybe I can build one. What do you think? You know, I didn't know nothing about licenses and stuff. You know, what's a license? You know, it's a driver's license. You don't know about no license. You know? So I just got some books and went into, you know, see how I build a transmitter. And Mr. Clark was helping me, my chemistry teacher. And Mr. Jones, my shop, electric shop teacher, was helping me. And now that Mr. Clark is talking about know. is Willie Clark. Okay, we know Willie. <laughs> but the NAACP now. Mm -hmm. Mr. Uh, Clark brought me some, you know, I, I built a transmitter, but it was on short wave, which nobody could really pick up because it was broadcasting way up in the short wave band. Mr. Clark gave me a crystal, which was for short wave. I got it to work it good, but nobody could hear it. So one day, uh, Mr. Jones had a bunch of army surplus come into the electric shop, and we were taking it apart. And I saw this device in it, and it said, one megahertz crystal. I just threw it off to the side or whatever, you know. And I got to my next class, and I got to thinking. I said, one megahertz is, I did my little math, is 1,000 cycles, and that's on the AM band. And I hurried up and rushed back to the electric shop, and it was gone. Somebody had unplugged it and took it. And I was just hard. I said, oh, my goodness, I could have just taken Mr. Jones would have given it to me. And it was two of them, and both of them were gone. So I asked him about it. He said, well, the class that was just in there, we tracked it down. And the guy said, yeah, I got it. I just thought it was interesting. I took it home. I'll sell it to you for a dollar. <laughs> I got the whole dollar and plugged it into my transmitter, and it didn't work. So I did some maneuvering and this and that and whatever. And I finally got it on the air, but it was on 1,000 kilocycles, which is the 10 on the AM. And there was another station there. Out of Alta Vista, it's still there now. WKDE is on 1000. And I couldn't move that thing to save my life, you know. So I got this book where you could order them, so forth, you know, and no questions asked. And I found one that was for the spot on the dial that I wanted. And got on the air with it, and I just made posters the next day and said, Man, Lance will be on this radio station. When, Lance, did you first? I'm trying to think. When I first heard it, was, I know it was in the 60s. 1967. And you were 15 years 15 old? 15 years old. Yeah. Right, right. That's it. And uh, I was on there, you know, I just hooked my little record players up and plugged it in. It, I didn't bring the pictures. The pictures are on my website. The two pictures that I have on there of me, the lead broadcasting with the little station and so forth. First I, first I couldn't get too far. And then I started, I found a way I could get that thing all the way in. Never mind. We had no trouble because <laughs> I lived at six at the corner of 16th and Fillmore. He lived across the street from the famous R. Walter Johnson, the tennis man. So he lived on the corner of 15 and Pierce, right cat corner from <laughs> Ann Spencer's house. Mm -hmm. So you could just walk out of her um, house and just slant right across and go down to his go down to his place, which was just a block away. Well, Lad was on the air, and everybody was talking about this, and I was looking right here. Here's Don Cornelius. Isn't that something? Don Cornelius was on Soul Train. Mm -hmm. and, um, well, this is where he started. I know, it, and mm -hmm. BET is doing a special. Now, Lad, he is 15 years old. Can you imagine? Because there's nothing Don Cornelius <laughs> ever did that Lad could not have done. Don Cornelius retired here recently and they do a lot of playbacks on um, a TV one Kathy Hughes' session. Right. Mm -hmm. But um, and they do it um, twice a, almost twice a week. But Lad could do anything. His voice is every bit as deep and rich as Cornelius. And this was what year? This year. This this book came out here. This was about sixty six. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it was about sixty six. Yep, yeah, that's it. But uh, so I didn't I didn't know nothing about running a radio station. I just knew what it sounded like, and I just took everything from the tape recorder and just duplicated it over to us. I'd get home at quarter to four, cut the station on, and just start playing Aretha Franklin, Respect, and everything. And I had a whole bunch of people say, "I want to broadcast. I want to broadcast." Actually, I couldn't pay them anything, so. And Ronnie Rathers and Piggy Megason yeah. and Kenny Banks and all of them came all in and they wanted to do a show. I said, okay, you come on at four, 
I'll come on at 4.30. And we just did, I had about nine guys that split up between then and 7 o'clock because at 7 o'clock it got dark and you couldn't broadcast too good at dark, in the dark. And these were high school kids? These were my, my fellow classmates. And they would go to school, you gotta listen to me, I'll be on at 4 o'clock. And it got to be a They were day. talented, but I don't remember uh, one of them personality-wise. I mean, I knew him, Pinky Megginson was mm -hmm. an all-time great Dunbar athlete, but as a uh, on the air personality, <laughs> led to all, to all of them, all of them, and what I was saying a little while ago about just being that close to him, you could almost throw a baseball mm -hmm. from his yard if if you had a good arm on you <laughs> down to my backyard. So it's, I probably came in like gangbusters at your. That's house. right. Uh -huh. I mean, you could you could hear just as clear. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I was amazed. Oh, I had it tuned so you, it sounded like another radio station. And they said, um, now you know, um, it, the word in the in the um, black community through the years, there's an expression called bootlegging. Bootlegging <laughs> is associated with selling illegal whiskey and, and all of that. So they said, um, you know, uh, Golan's has a bootleg. Operation going. I said, "What? Who said that?" The, the kids were saying oh, they the would use an expression that. meaning he's on the air. They hipped us. I mean, when you think about young people and what they taught us, I mean, all this stuff about being on the air. They used to teach a radio. You could take a course called radio at Dunbar years ago, and they draw the little scales and and how the uh, volumes came up and the kilowatts, all that kind of stuff. Here Lad is on the air, but what I wanted to say about Lad is, he even would give you a little um, tidbit of news. You remember that? Oh yeah. Uh -huh. He would say stuff that was going on. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you talk about a cultural phenomenon, mm -hmm. I, I put Lad and Brother Hubbard um, I, I put him, but Lad, see, Hubbard was a grown man, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and he had another um, profession. He was a barber right. up in the Fifth Street area, and so he was doing that primarily on weekends and things. Well, I know the young people used to listen, because I was working with Lynn Cannigan. and we had this uh, Solar Go-Go place on Main Street, mm -hmm. and Christopher Sharp and a lot of those other people, they would carry these boom boxes. Now, I'm yeah. not into the music thing at all, but they were listening and they were telling me about this. But they also said that that's where they knew where the um, meetings were going to be, the civil rights meetings. And yes. the thing. Let me, she would yeah, tell, let me, let me let tell you about that. See, our newspaper, you know, you know how our newspaper was a trip back then. That's all I can say. Our newspaper, okay, our newspaper was, uh, well, very one-sided. Very racist. If, uh, okay, you said it. <laughs> if uh, E.C. Glass won a tournament at the mm -hmm. school, it was headlines on the section above Cuba or something. If Dunbar won a tournament, we had to look maybe two or three times and we find it beside the obituary. Well, what I did, I would take that little section right there and I'd read it on the, read it on the air. So, was it Walt Hazard made 43 points against Camel County? So forth would do that, and, you know, and all of that, and so forth. And like I would bring it out to the forefront, and everybody was just eating it up like big time. I would read stuff. My mom was subscribed to the uh, Journal and Guide out of Richmond. That's right. And um, you know, I would get that before anybody else did because it came in the mail. And if I saw something interesting in there, I would read it. Hey, so and so and so did this, so and so and so did that. And I had a little segment where I would do this at it was 5:30 in the afternoon. I'd give all of the facts about what was going on. It might have been a march in Richmond. It might have been something else or whatever. At the time, for example, Mr. Charles Mangum was running for city council. And, That's right. And uh, he actually, he said, well, you know, he did a voter, he said, why don't you do a voter registration thing, you know, because I can't do it, I can't win without everybody registering. That's the first thing. So we got on the air and said that somebody from WKKD is going to be knocking on your door and seeing if you're registered to vote. And this is when uh, Florence Beverly and Chris Sharp and everybody we were, came over here and were knocking on people's door. They didn't register. We gave them the form to fill out and where to go take it. Charles Mangum even did a speech 
A half, he did a, a 20 minute speech on my station, on the bootleg station, and told about what he was doing, what he stood for, and everything. He had his campaign workers with him, they said something. And that was about the biggest thing. And the whole time, my parents are going, What's going on upstairs? <laughs> you know, but like, there's something going on upstairs. Hi, Mr. Mangum. Like, what's he doing here? And the phenomenal thing about it is, Charles Mangum had been to our university law school, and he married a Lynchburg woman, Lovella Brand, from Darrington. But nobody knew Mangum. So Mr. Thornhill asked um, the Harris brothers who had the um, uh, prevailing interest in the funeral home at the time, um, it said, um, would you let Mangum take a place in the building upstairs and that'll be his law practice? And they said, well, as long as it's not disrupted. So you just walk in, this is before they remodeled and everything, go up the steps and Charles Mangum's um, office once more Lad was responsible because nobody knew Chuck. Mm -hmm. Nobody knew him but his wife who had met him. I believe um, she went to school in North Carolina and he had gone to a and and, um, and plus his father was the state president of the NAACP down there. And he's right. Here you had Mr. C, CWC, getting ready to make history. He had retired um, from Dunbar in 68. So then these people went to work on him, these prominent business people on C. So they're pushing C, who had tremendous name recognition. Then you had another group um, led by Senator Shul. He wasn't a senator then. And they wanted Hazel Bolware. And Hazel Bolware was very active with the group that met over at the Lodge of the Fishermen out on Boonesboro, not far from where you live. And so Hazel Bulware was a prominent a member of the Lynx and the um, um, sorority and her husband was um, a doctor and he was the team doctor, Dr. Ralph Bulware for our athletic teams up there. Lad, my point is that Lad made Mangum, I mean he, he just made it. So all three of them ran at the same time? All three of them ran at the same time mm -hmm. and of course um, C ended up uh, prevailing. I had said in a, in a meeting over at Mr. C's house, if, if you have multiple candidates, why can't we endorse uh, Mangum and um, Mr. C? Then you're getting the young group in. Oh, they said that nobody knows Mangum. <laughs> I said, you think nobody knows it. Why do you think these young people are all of a sudden registering to vote? One reason was the sororities were going out, Yvonne Ferguson, Ann Wesley, and that group, but Clarice Banks, all of them, Dee Fallon, but at the same time, led almost single-handedly. Um, got to Mangum was handsome, slim, um, <laughs> articulate, and was building up his, his business. And um, so then, when Thornhill found out how effective Lad was, you, I'm going to let him pick this up. <laughs> Every Sunday morning, I let Mad Lad was the voice of community funeral home. Do you remember that? You probably yeah, live I in St. John's <laughs> and have an early morning service. Mm -hmm. But um, the radio shows used to come on. Reverend Winston Jones, who are just um, recently deceased at, at First Baptist South Lynchburg. He had a show. Um, C.W. Dunning had a, really had a show that came on. 10 o'clock. And one or two others. They had these TV shows. I mean, uh, radio shows. But Thornhill had a show. And he had an agreement with Lad about the music. Whoops, tell what that was. Well, Mahalia Jackson That's it. and the Roberta Martin singers were the only thing that he wanted on there. He wanted his traditionals. And that was it. And that went on for well, decades. 
So when did you start doing that? Oh, when I first started on uh, WJJS, which is uh, another, another story yeah. in itself, right? That's it. We started doing that, but yeah, it was it was it was neat back then. I mean, like the community, and I didn't know what I was doing. I was just, hey, this might be a good idea. Let's let's put this on the air. And Langham was the last minute thing. We said, Mr. Langham, you want to speak on the stage? Okay, come on up here about five minutes. You know that kind of a thing. Yeah. Just a spur of the moment thing. You know, but it helped out a lot. I gave the scores out, like I said, on the football That's game. Right. You know, nobody knew who won the game because the paper didn't print it. You had to find it. If you didn't go to the game, you didn't know who won. But you could tune in the next day, at, uh, you know, and I would tell you every, not only who won, but who made the most points and who, who, who sunk the most baskets and everything, you know. And that was, that was just a standard thing. And I had people, I had people giving me money. Guy stopped me on the street and said, man. I said, yeah, what you want, man? Give me $10. Yeah, I like what you're doing, man. Keep it up. Oh, oh great. great. <laughs> okay, you know. Yeah, yeah. I you got your nickname. Did you tell us? Yeah, the, the, guy, yeah, the guy in the book there, yeah. yeah. I guess I, I got everything from the station in uh, Chicago. But you also said that um, your area that you could broadcast even reached up to the uh, Virginia Seminary. Right, right. Look, from 15th and Piers, after I got it to sounding real good and everything, yeah. I could get about to the plaza that way. I could get about to uh, Rivermont Bridge and Rivermont. You couldn't come to... It wouldn't come to Rivermont for some reason. I covered White Rock Hill and Seminary like a blanket. It was just, my house was right there on the hill, and the antenna I had was almost pointed at it, you know. So what everybody did was, they would drive within the area and park, which was interesting. You know, you would just, you know, people would just park, you'd, okay, we pick it up here real good, and just have a party right there beside the People's batteries were going dead, <laughs> you know, just had a party right there, you know, and you keep the car running or whatever. And when I said, okay, it's 7 o'clock time, I signed off at 7 o'clock. 7 o'clock, time to go, and I cut the station up, you hear, and <laughs> this car started up because that was it, you know. And they'd go back to room on, you know. A couple of them would, would get these out. You could put it, the radio next to a water pipe or they were doing all kind of things just to pick up the station. And that's how, see, that's how I got caught, see. <laughs> At the time, you know, like, as we know now, uh, Brother Hubbard owns uh, WLL. But WLL was a rock and roll station, and the only rock and roll station during the day in Lynchburg. And naturally, you're going to take a few of their listeners by this little guy coming on it. Who is this guy? You know, so the guy at the time, Mr. Mr. Hudley Griffith, he was the owner of WLL at the time. And he was, I don't like that guy on the air. And I'm going to use that guy, okay? <laughs> I don't like that guy on the air over there. And he called the FCC, which uh -huh. is the radio station police. That's right. You know, the company. Really so good. he called them, and I didn't know it. I was just over there, bro, having a good time, you know. And the guy says, the FCC didn't get you. Bro. <laughs> you know, whatever. I didn't know who they were or whatever. So after a while, the station was on for 11 months. I think it was on for 11 months. And uh, like April 68, I was out riding my bicycle, which I would go out while the other guy was on and see how good my signal was. And then I'd come peek it back up a little bit. And I noticed this car that kept circling the block, you know, with government tags on it. And I don't know what this is all about. So the guy stopped and got out the car. He had this big unit with him and whatever. And on the back of the unit was stamped FCC. He was, a, he, was at, he was at 15th and Fillmore, mm -hmm. so he was right <laughs> the block away, you know. And he, I asked him, I said, sir, what are you doing? And he acted like I wasn't even there, you know, a little black guy that, you know, I am. get out of here, kid, you bother me, <laughs> or whatever. So I kept on after him. I said, are you by any chance looking for an illegal radio station? <laughs> oh, he jumped in. <laughs> yeah. I said, uh, what you going to do to this guy when you <laughs> buy it? <laughs> So forth. So I figured that with my effort and everything, he's gonna give me a license if I honestly saw, showed him the place and hey, this is my station. You know, can't, where do I sign? Didn't work like that. You got to get this thing off the air. There's gonna be big problems. Your dad is responsible. He might go to jail. You might get fined a couple thousand dollars. I had tears coming down my eyes. Oh my goodness! I didn't come on the next day. And the guy said, "Why aren't you coming on?" He said, "We got busted." Oh, the, there was a hush over Lynchburg. That's I didn't right. come on the next wow. day. That was a hush over Lynchburg. But, to make a long story short, another radio station, which was losing money at the time, was uh, WDMS AM and FM. They were playing elevator music on the AM and the FM. And nobody was advertising on it, which, as you know, advertising is the main thing. You know, they couldn't, they couldn't sell anything on, on the radio because nobody was listening to them. They were just on the air getting ready to go out of business. 
And the guy said, man, there's a little black guy over there, man, and he's got listeners and everything and whatever. Shul Furniture Company called this station and asked him, he said, uh, you know, we want to talk about some advertising. And the guy said, yeah. He said, well, do you have any contact with this little black guy that's got this little bootleg station over here? No. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we know anything about it or whatever. So the guy said, well, that's the station that I want to advertise on. That's said, right. Can you find them for me? And that's like saying, you know, I'm out of Mercedes. Where do you, you know, can you recommend me a Chevrolet or something? You know, whatever. And they were mad. They said, we got to do something about this. Because this little guy, there's a format out here that's not being touched. That's the black format. Lynchburg is, what, 20, 23% at that particular time? Yeah. And that's a market that nobody is gone after. So he said, well, let's change our FM to a black format and keep our easy listening station on the AM. And we might make some money with it. That was the same station that Brother Hubbard was on. Brother Hubbard was on from 6 until 7 in the morning. He had an hour, and the hour was sold out. He hardly could play music. It was sold out. Then they went back to easy listening music, and it was three or four commercials for the rest of the day. But Brother Hubbard was running the whole station. So they said, let's expand him. Let's put Brother Hubbard on until 10. They got another guy named Long John Miller, which yeah, that's is right. Gus Miller's Gus Miller's uh, brother. My cousin. You right? Yeah. Cousin. Okay. Okay. Gus used to live on Wild Street. Wild Street. Wild Street. Wild Street. Okay. Between thirteen. Uh huh. Yeah. That's, I used to look out the window to see John walking down the hill to the radio station, you know. And then I came on from three until uh, I had last period study hall, so I left early and went down the station. I was on three to five, which he expanded three to seven, and that's how I first got started. They said, well, you know, like. We got to get this guy over here and hire him before he goes go to jail or something. So John Miller had a rich voice, like a man. That that um, a taping that we did, maybe two hours, with Ann Spencer. Spencer, as John Miller. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. John Miller's father and Ann Spencer were very good friends. He was a smart fellow, and he was younger than she. But he was, um, he was like you. He was mechanically inclined to do things. So he'd go down there and help do the things around the house and everything. John Miller's father. So John would just follow his daddy. Um, but John Miller was also um, what we would call a maverick of sorts. He loved this whole thing about mm -hmm. taping. And we taped Ed Spencer. And we told him we were going to tape her. Then after she made certain statements, she called me and said, I'm going to discuss with you because I spoke candidly about some things. But some of these people are very important in this community. I don't take back anything I said, but I was that was a sharing. So I said, no, I, I can't edit this because you would be doing the thing that, as a creative writer, you wouldn't want anybody to do. You, you told um, H.L. Mencken, you wrote what you thought, and you weren't going to change for anything. And the same is, is true about that. Now that tape is up at the Vonnegut Rap Book and Manuscripts Library at mm -hmm. Yale. But that's John Miller. So you're talking about Lad, Brother Hubbard, and John Miller. I mean, three powerful personalities and whatnot, but but they didn't go out to do Brother Hubbard focused on trying to make money for dinner bail down here and for George Stewart and some of those people. Shules led from day one wanted to do something innovative and, and creative and he did. I'm not saying Brother Hubbard didn't do it because he surely did and that's a phenomenon unto itself. But mm -hmm. um, I give Lad all kinds of credit. And when a guy scared you, what did you end up doing? <laughs> Some of the LCC guy? Yeah. Well, he just told me to cut it off or there's going to be trouble. So I just cut it off. I didn't want, you know, my parents would have, you had a what upstairs? <laughs> you know, yeah. kind of a thing. You know, he knew I was doing something in my little laboratory, but you know, I had just one of those that keep out, no trespassing signs on my room, you know, that kind of a thing, which, you know, they didn't go in there. It was like, you know, forbidden or whatever. But anyway, so he had heard, so Ron Joseph and Fletcher Hubbard came over to my house. I had just cut the station off on like that Friday. 
And uh, I was over there disgusted because I got all this investment break. break. I was just sitting there playing some songs, and, I, and the doorbell rang. It was Ron Joseph, the station manager for WDMS, and it was uh, Fletcher. And they said, well, we, we want to you know, keep your idea going with the radio station when you're just didn't, you know, work in something. I said, all all right, you know, whatever. They took me and Troy Jones and Sam Stevens. He hired three of our disc jockeys to work on this big F film, which F film wasn't big then, so I was saying, well, let's put us on the AM. They didn't want to mess with their easy listening music, but the F film wasn't the thing then, That's as right. it is now. So they gave us the F film, and we could do what we wanted to do with it, you know, and we just, and it just went from there. And that's how w, they changed the call letters to WJJS. And that was how WJJS got started. And it's a phenomenon statewide and area wide. Mm -hmm. If you want to go to Richmond, Petersburg, any of those, you get on the FM channel. Now it's crossover somewhat. But basically, uh, people like Lad and Brother Huffman and people like that, they, they forced the, the um, downtown merchants to take another look at somebody, if you look at these yearbooks, you'll see pictures of um, of the Shul furniture people, uh, Coca Cola, mm -hmm. the um, First National Bank, all of them, because they're saying anything that publicizes what we're doing, we're reaching a group out there, right. so they didn't have any trouble financing this because mm -hmm. they could finance the yearbook with the yep. Justins, um, with the Justins. Um, Company, but Lad staying on. I mean, Thornhill. If Lad hadn't done anything but that Sunday morning show, he would have been a force to to uh, be reckoned with. Do you remember uh, Peck's department store downtown? Sure, I do. It was at the corner of Seventh and Main. I believe. Well, it's George where George uh, uh, GE place. Financial is now. Mm -hmm. Okay, it was a big department store there, and it was right when uh, JGS first started. They could not give away an FM radio. You know, they couldn't. I mean, there were FM radios on the on the counter had dust on them. You know, they could not give away an FM radio because nobody want. You know, no, what you want an FM radio? It's got beautiful music and and uh, nothing. You know, nothing was on the FM. So what happened was, uh, <laughs> this is going out. All of a sudden, the radio started sounding like hotcakes. Because you were and they didn't know why. They still they couldn't keep on keep on the shelf. Got the FM, we're And this went on for about, you know, um, they were saying, what, what happened? And it was WJJS coming on the radio. Now where wasn't your um, office at the top of the Allied Arts Building? At one time and it was at the uh, it started out at, at with the first at Virtues Building, which is the Bank of America building, the eighth of Maine. That's where it originally started. That's what uh, WJJS was. Moved it out of Arts Building, then moved out to the Tower Shack. Then moved to Roanoke. <laughs> Long story behind it. But anyway, uh, I know a lot of folks would want to know on this uh, video presentation, like, what happened to me and WJJS? Yes. I'm sure somebody has asked me about that. So. Well, as you know, um, advertising, advertising revenue is what keeps a radio station going. You know, and if you can sell somebody like Fletcher was real good at advertising, he could he could sell it with Eskimo refrigerator and so forth. You know, so Fletcher would be out there. You know, hey, buy some time on Mad Last Show brought to you by the First College. I was telling him, uh, advertisement is the main thing. We were going to get into how come I'm not at JJS anymore. I'm gonna tell you tell you what tell you what happened with that. Okay, so at the time it was a new thing. You know, you got a black market to serve. Let's say if you want to get to black market, Lynchburg Jobbing House was buying down there. Sure yeah, furniture, right. you know, prime time, rich on anything that was easy credit. You know, you bought on there. Dean's credit clothing, all everybody was buying. You couldn't pay them to be on another station. Well, unfortunately, this kind of ran out as far as uh, as far as black advertisement is concerned, and it got the opposite effect for some reason. Due to management changes, a big company bought JJS and so forth, and all they want, the bottom line, they don't care who's there. It's clear it's true. They don't care who's there or who's working for you. You're just a number, and we got to make some money. So how do you make some money with it? First off, you got this black station over here, and unfortunately, as far as advertisement is concerned, you are now the, um, if you advertise with the blacks, you don't know what you're going to get as far as the return is concerned. You have to be certain that where you put your advertising dollar. We had a real popular car dealer over here. I don't know if I should call names or not. A real popular car dealer over here. That uh, I just said, now how come, you know, this was like about 10 years ago. 
how come you don't advertise on WJJS? They said, okay, well, when you advertise on the country station, you get 12 people in there, though about 11 of them can afford and buy a car. If you advertise on WJJS, those same 12 people got bad credit. All they know that is all my children, they don't know anything else or whatever, and they can't afford a car. So which one am I going to put my advertising dollar on? You put it on the country station because that's where your money is coming in. And just hope that blacks are coming in and buy something. Well, this has been going on for a long time. And a big company will say, hey, how come the country station is getting $200,000 a month for advertisement, and I got this black station over here that's only doing 60. And can't anybody push it because they'd rather be on the country station. Why is that? It's because, unfortunately, the black listener is not as valuable as it was back in the, back in the day. And when I say valuable, it means sure. like the potential of buying something. And the personality. See, one of the things, um, Lad had a personality, who we call a persona. You knew he was up on the language. All this stuff about new expressions and everything. He said that. Mm -hmm. Young people could clue into it, but so could older people, like he said. So if earlier in the, in the day people are listening to religious music, then the working people go to work. Some of the older people stay at home. Then they come in with, with people like that. But these, um, these people figured out nationwide that there was money in country music. It was, an, um, somebody said, Napoleon said this, China is the sleeping giant. Let her sleep. Because once she wakes up, you've got to deal with billions of people. And that whole new international market. And what they did was, the phenomenon was, that the people in the broadcast industry said, let's go down there to Nashville, where they're making tons of money down there, and let's take that sound and run it nationwide. People said, people in New York don't want to hear all that hillbilly music and stuff, but somehow or other, because of what you said, they said, well, they want to drive such and such an automobile, and they want to uh, buy cars, products, they want to do this, they want to do that. Mm -hmm. So if they're going to do that, if, what difference does it make if up in New York and Chicago and Detroit, you're not doing that. So this strange thing happened. Now you turn on and you got all these big shows and you got Garth Brooks and all these, Miley Cyrus and all of them. Mm -hmm. They are multi-millionaires many times over. Mm -hmm. And and you a go to a people. rap concert, you'll get a fight. You won't make no money. That's right. <laughs> Unfortunately. That's the thing. And it's, 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 real, it's real strange. It's like the fact that it's, it's kind of like a turnaround right now because of the fact that right now, if you are a Mercedes dealer, if you are a BMW dealer, and you're saying, I got an advertising budget, where do I put it at? You put it on the country station. Should I put it on JJS? No. I might get one person in there. A TV might buy a Mercedes. And... That's going to be it. You know, they, they got to figure out where they're going to put their money at. Now, if you're a Toyota dealer or something, you might chance JJS, but still, you can go to the YYD, and you for certain that you're going to get some turnaround in there as far as the advertising concerned. We used to do uh, remotes. Remember those remotes we used to do? Yes. Oh, yeah. Now, the, the, the uh, object of having a remote is to get people in there to look at the cars, okay? Mm -hmm. So in order to do that, we'd be giving away stuff. Hey, come on in to the remote. And we'll get a free cassette and a free this and a free that. And come on by and first car will come by and get it. They come by and get the cassette and they leave. They wouldn't look at the new Toyota over here. They wouldn't do that. You know? And that's what, that's what was going on with that. So the guy said, I can't spend no money with y'all because I'm not selling no cars. Mm -hmm. And then, and then so it's economics now. Yeah, it's economics. So they, they wanted what, to what? change the, excuse me, they wanted to change so that on the app personalities, they wanted to say, well, they being the people who advertise, they would say, now, we're not interested in this guy, this personality. So we want everybody to play the top songs and to do this and to do that, all of that business. And then you're robbing the, 
you're robbing the culture mm -hmm. of, mm -hmm. of something very special. Right, right. But see, but see, the thing about it is like um, the advertising now. That's where you put your money in. That's where you put your money in. And you, in a, in a, in a picture, like for instance, we have. I can talk about it now because he's not here. Jim Mitchell, yeah. over the Ford place. He's a black guy. Mm -hmm. He was buying on WYYD because he knew where his money was coming from. He knew he'd get a bunch of the brothers over there to be looking at the cars, looking at the cars. They might got bad credit. He's not going to do that. He gets some YYD listings over there. He's going to sell a truck, 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 just like that. So he's a smart black businessman. He knows where to put his money. I couldn't talk him into buying a Diddy Squad on JGS when I was over there. But he would buy all over YYD and K92. And K92 ended up being the top advertising builder in this area. They're playing all top 40 music. So here's Clear Channel that now owns JGS said, okay, Let's, let's get after K92's audience. So they came in to me and said, hey, let's play some uh, Justin Timberlake and some of the white artists and so forth and mix Cheryl Crow and mix them in with the music. And I'm saying, you know, that's not exactly going to work as far as numbers are concerned. Folks would call me up, man, why you got Cheryl Crow in there? <laughs> hey, Big Boss said play some Cheryl Crow and mix it up. They were trying to turn JJS into a top 40 station instead of a black station. It didn't work because of the fact that... Uh, the black music kind of overwhelmed it. And they said, well, we got to get everything that, we got to get rid of everything that's the old regime from JJS and start again, which was me. I was representative of the old genre. So they said, look, Lad has got to go. Because every time you hear Lad on the air, they think about JJS, and they think about black, and they think about no advertisement. And that, that is a sad, narrow-minded concept by those people. Because what they didn't realize is uh, um, some of these young people, like Lad, went off to school. Wally Harris, the Wilkerson brothers, all of them, and I could just go on and on. They came back later, some of them, some of them moved to other cities and things, and they entered into a portion of the middle class. Mm -hmm. So they could afford to buy these cars, and they mm -hmm. could afford to go downtown and buy furniture, and they did do it. And now the furniture companies still dealing with that concept, like he's saying, because even over at Ford, you would look up and say, well, why would a uh, company like Jim Mitchell Ford, why, would, why wouldn't they have those pretty uh, cars up there instead of those trucks? But that was what mm -hmm. the listening audience wanted to see. And at that time, not only the listening audience, but the television, audience mm -hmm. wanted to do. And what Lad is saying is the phenomenon of, 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 of a culture. Can you imagine what happened up at Motown? He's got Aretha Franklin um, on um, one of these things, uh, R-E-S-B-E-C-T, respect all of that, Michael Jackson, all those people that burst on the scene in the, in the 60s, they literally Tore things up, but what happened was, like he said, that when um, um, Barry Gordy moved from Detroit, which was going through some some uh, multiple changes and all that kind of stuff, moved out to L.A. So did the concept. So there was New York, you know all the mm -hmm. stations that the New York, Chicago, Detroit, Boston, Atlanta, and so forth. And they said, now that's where the people are. That's where they buy furniture. That's why they do this. That's why they do that. Mm -hmm. And so then you get somebody saying, well, we're going to another format. What does that do to the listener? It drives them away. And then mm -hmm. you go and you see people saying, I, I, there's no way I'm going to miss as the world turns. God and light. These were the people who were a fixture with the radio culture settling for something that didn't even include them. Right. And you know what I mean? I know Not until mean. recently, till very recently, have you been able to look at those soap operas, and when I say you, I'm talking about somebody like us, African Americans, and see yourself. Right, I understand. I mean, I understand. for years, decades, mm -hmm. they showed that stuff, and Carl Anderson married um, um, one of those um, young ladies, and then um, Zeta, Zeta Coles, Mary Christopher Henley, she was on soap opera 
And people would call and say, Zeta's going to be on Thursday. She might not be on again until 10 days later mm -hmm. and whatnot. That's, that's how rare right, we right. saw ourselves on that. It is, a, it is amazing what has happened and what we have allowed to happen. Because if, if some of us had put our foot down and said, no, no, but we can prove the demographics. We can prove that some of these places, we do buy these products. You want to make like we don't buy them. Have you noticed that we always get on the radio and we say, tell them so-and-so so sent you by, or tell them you heard it on JJ. Be sure and tell them that, you know, Brother Hubbard sent you by, or tell them that so-and-so so sent you by. That is for you to tell Jim Mitchell, I heard this thing on the radio, That's right. and I am a listener of the station, and I'm buying this car from you. And they just won't do it. You know, I had a guy come in at one of our car dealers out there, bought a brand new Toyota or whatever. Didn't say a word about where he heard it from, so the Toyota man don't know if he would have come in anyway, or if he had heard it on JJS. He doesn't know this because the guy didn't tell him. If he had said, oh yeah, I heard this on the last station, that would have been a one brownie point. Somebody come in, that's two brownie points, he would have signed another $2,000 contract with the station. Instead, he goes to K92 where he can be guaranteed an audience. But anyway, but getting back, getting back to my thing was um, Clear Channel, who says we got to do something to bring up the billing on JJS, but we just can't sell it because it's the black station. That's what the salesman was saying. It's people saying that's the black station. We don't want that kind of clientele in here. We don't want that to happen in here. For example, you know where False Fuel is down? Yes. Uh, okay. False Fuel um, advertised, begged and begged. We finally got them on there. Just right before I left, begged and begged by the advertisement on JJS. We finally got the guy, he gave us about $200 worth of advertisement and so forth. You know, two black guys came in and robbed him the next night. Guess who got blamed? Uh, it was, you know, the radio station. The radio station. Well, yeah, yeah y'all drawing the wrong kind of people in here. That was that robbery they had back in 98. I never forget because he, he blamed us for it. You think he signed any more contract with it? Nope. The only, you know, and that's, that's the kind of thing, look, we got to do something about this. K92 over there, all they got to do is put the contract book down and the guy will sign it. You ain't got to worry about nothing. We got to get some of that business. That's what the management was saying. Okay, first thing we got to do, we got to switch up the music. We got to play some Cheryl Crow. We got to throw some Lady Gaga in there. And we got to do this and do that to try to grab this other audience and so forth. And Lad got to go. You know, he's, everybody see Lad, they think of the old regime. And that's what happened. So what are you doing now, Lad? <laughs> I'm still doing my music service, my real property. Oh, I'm making it. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm laughing at them now because of the fact that now they got an all-white staff playing the same rap that I would have been playing when I was there because at the time in 98, rap wasn't as popular as That's it is right. now mm -hmm. for some reason. I don't like it. I love my, I looked on the chart the other day. I ain't recognized the one person that was on there. Lil Wayne, Lil this, Lil that, whatever. He's got Lil in front of his name. That's Look right. out. You know, whatever. But th that's all you hear now. And the white kids are liking it. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm saying, see, this is what didn't happen in 98. But now, have you ever been on a red light? And you hear all this boom, 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 yeah. next, <laughs> next door. You know, have yeah, a good and, you, and, you, and you look next door and it's a white guy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that happens. I said, turn. And he got Lil Wayne blasted. But you asked this, this recently happened. You know, this, this is sure. like a trend. Now, I do gigs out at the Boomsboro Country Club or something like that. And just, you know, for a uh, uh, Jefferson Forest, and they have their team dance out there, and this sophisticated bunch of people, their kids just drop them off in a Mercedes and so forth. They come up and say, you got some Lil Wayne? Yeah. <laughs> Coming right up, you know, and all that. And, and, you, and you know what? Here's what's interesting. The phenomenon of the culture and the crossover changes. For instance, um, my neighbor came down some affluent people in marketing and sales. And they lived up in this beautiful home up on this south slope. And uh, they said, we'd love for you all to come. My um, late wife was living there. So we go up to the house. It was a graduation party. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now here's somebody getting ready to go to University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And another um, one of the kids going up to UVA. And these people are um, doing a good job. The man was in um, um, something dealing with the railroads and airplanes and all of that. So I hear this music. 
I said, man, you all are some imp neighbors. I don't know you all did that. And um, they said, oh, we got a we got a live uh, DJ, tremendous personality. Do you know Glad? I said, do I know him? But what about it? They said, hey, just go around here. So we went around the yard where everybody was. There on the deck was Lad with his full ensemble. Oh, all of his things. He has the best equipment, the best sound, the best voice. And Lad is up there. I said, well, <laughs> carry me back. Here he is up here, out there, as he said, within um, walking distance of Jefferson Forest. Uh -huh. Out there near... Um, Thomas Jefferson's restored home mm -hmm. at Poplar Forest, out there playing to that group, which says this guy is, is tremendous. We don't have to ask him to play so and so. So you look up, and they are doing the electric slide. They, with a handful of African American friends and things. I think that me, you, your, uh, their wife, and another guy. We're only four there. Yes. Uh -huh. That's right. And the guy came up to me, he said, he said, uh, you know Mr. Stamps? He said, I said, yeah, I know Mr. Stamps, my uh, teacher back in school. He said, well, he, you know, he, he, he's coming up here in a few minutes. Yeah, you're kidding, right? And here they come holding a hamburger and everything. Hey, lad, how you doing? I said, I didn't believe this. So it was, we was on then. <laughs> and, and I didn't know, uh -huh. and I didn't know where he lived. So when I packed up and left, I said, I'm going over to Mr. Stamps out. And I came over there and he gave me the, the grand tour. I said, yeah, this something, but, but that's just an example of what the music thing is now, you know, and that's what I'm doing now. I play for a lot of people that um, I'll be the only, only brother in the place, you know. Yeah. And, and, the, and the, the, the strange thing, we call it juxtaposing, mm -hmm. the very thing that they were saying to you all 10, 8, 12, 15 years ago, you got to change or die. Mm -hmm. The very people who said change or die were the ones who blinked. They changed. And so they said, well, our kids want to play that. So you go up to a school now, mm -hmm. and you see the kids with their pants hanging all <laughs> off, and everybody wearing jeans, everybody. And that means the school, because of the location, is predominantly uh, white. You know, with a with a nice uh, mm -hmm. a mixture of one kind or the other. The true thing about the American dream. But if you listen to the music, mm -hmm. the music that was persona non grata <laughs> is now the music of choice. So you can look, you can listen to Fifth Sense. Uh -huh. All of these people end up in hey, all these all these folk yep. who are who are anti everything. Did you hear F the, the, uh, Bill F Cosby F thing that he did the other yes. day when he, he had that speech? Bill Cosby hit it in a nutshell the other day. I love Bill Cosby. That's my man. Whenever he says something, listen to him. That's Bill right. Cosby came the other day, and Bill Cosby said his, uh, he was talking to a friend of his who was a limousine driver. And these limousine drivers, so that rich, rich folks had their kids going to the prom. And they were, you know, brought the limousine. Now, he's a black guy. He was out there taking the kids to the prom. So he drove up. And all the kids got into the car and so forth, you know. And he had the, you know, the parents had the music and everything, had the little country music and stuff playing or whatever. He's gonna take about five kids to the prom or whatever. As soon as he got out of range of the parents, the song went off. Here come Lil Wayne. Boom! <laughs> and the limousine driver looked back and said, and they was back there jamming, but they got out of range of the parents first, because the parents thought they were gonna have their little country nice music and a little. You know, uh, Garth Brooks and all the rest of them going on with it when they left. And time, he said, time they got out of range, to <laughs> stuff to stop. And here come Lil Wayne. And it was like that, and it was on all the way to the prom. <laughs> and he just shook his head and said, I don't believe it. But that's the thing now. That, nobody knew that was going to happen. That's right. Nobody, they, in fact, uh, JJS's management in 98 was fighting it. This, this rap thing ain't going to ain't gonna last. It's going to be a, you know, an eight track tape or something. It's going to be hit and gone, you know, whatever. And the third thing has gotten phenomenal. One year, I believe, rap outsold country. Sure. That was shocking. I, I, I wouldn't believe it in myself. What well, do you think? It's the generation rebelling against their parents, because that's... See, that happened in the 50s, too. You know, it's sure. kind of another thing or whatever. But uh, the music has a great beat to it. Sure. I mean, it doesn't have this... You know, and boom! It's, yeah. you know, it's, it's just different. Sure. I think 
one of the things that I think that when James Brown representing the old school <laughs> and Michael Jackson representing the crossover, then when they said, well, now it is not unacceptable to, to see um, uh, James Brown, even though he said, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. He was saying that. And then you had um, Michael Jackson sing a song about a big rat or whatever it was being. Yeah. And so you, you had that. But then you had the phenomenon of the moonwalk. And when that burst on the scene in the, in the early 80s, I mean, here is the greatest dancer in the world. And TV opens up to all of that. Then there's these new fashions that go along with it. And these personalities with these names, Snoop Dogg and Dr. Dre and Jay-Z and all of these names, they just, they just come on. Then you get these females and they're showing everything they can possibly pass, the senses, mm -hmm. on TV. And yes, some of it is, um, you know, kids rebelling. But, but there's a positive side to it because those kids, like he said, you stop at a stoplight and you look over and hear the boom box is just going off big time. You look over there and you expect to see a young brother driving a car and instead of him, that four white guys going maybe to meet one or two of those people. The, the malls have to change American culture. You know, you go to the mall, everybody's out there. So then the kids accept each other. You go to the video stores, you go to the pizza parlors, and mm -hmm. everybody's out there, including adults. And so when you go to buy clothes now, it's it's just um, mm -hmm. a whole nother kind of thing. Well, but what happens is those people who make the money, those, I call them merchants, and I, for whatever name people want to really give them, that's left up to them, they don't want to say, they're just too proud to say, look, you know, lad, you, and this one, and that one, you all told us what was going to be happening. You told us that what goes around, comes around. And if you're in the right place at the right time, a whole lot of people can make some money. So we want you to come back and bring, bring the best of what it is that you have. Because we know one thing, we know when those kids wear these new fashions, it, it no longer makes any difference who they are. So you know, you see some jeans, and you say they're not wearing the bells now, they're wearing something else. But if you look at them, it is just not black people, and it's just not people who like country music wearing the jeans. So then you go and you look at some movie star paying $1,700 for a jean outfit, and you say, man, I can go down there. <laughs> to the old job and, was, and get that. See, history is repeating itself. History is repeating That's what itself. I'm but just in a more open thing nowadays. But like uh, like uh, back in the fifties, it, it happened before. You had a lot of white folks listening to Fast Domino and, and all of them like that. But they did it secretly. They did it. We call them closet listeners. That's true. You know, they did it secretly. They listened to their you know all this stuff. And then they come back out, and the mama would see them. It would be like, Ooh, sorry now, or whatever. Then they go back in the background, and be like. I don't want to hold out of love. I'll put these sheets and listen to the radio and stuff like that. That's how it was. Now it's the same thing, but it's open. It's but accepted. Jazz, jazz has always had a big mm -hmm, acceptance. Mm -hmm. I mean, Even all in the black community. Because yeah, uh, uh, the black community has been most creative. I'm not, I'm not much of a musician or I don't much about it, but I do know that mm -hmm. um, uh, a lot of creativity has come out of the black community. Mm -hmm. and. Um, especially in the music field, and um, the uh, jazz, and, and even rap, which I don't understand. <laughs> I understand. It's, very, very good. Um, uh, it's, it's new and, and, and creative uh -huh. and vibrant, and I think that is, uh, I think the whole community is benefiting from it. Maybe a lot of people don't, haven't acknowledged it, right, but right, I right. think um, America has really been very fortunate. That this driving force. Mm -hmm. sure. And then you take people like Bruce Springsteen. Here you get people that, that classic he did, born in America, 
where people say, we're tired of war. Mm -hmm. We're tired of going halfway across the globe to kill people and for our generation to go, go here and get killed and things like that. So you find consummate artists who would have been mainstream. They are now um, doing a protest movement. Can you imagine some guy 60 years old singing, singing anti-war songs? But a lot of that is happening. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I'm saying? And so I believe that what we should do is um, say, well, there are fads. Some things come and go, and you're glad that they left. Now, disco was real popular at one time. And disco kind of faded out. And the disco clubs went with it. You know, mm -hmm. and and that's all right, because something else came along in its place at last. But some of the things you say are exactly true. Even now, you can turn the TV on, and there are people who still listen to Miles Davis and those great classics to Duke and to all of that. My but, husband does. Absolutely, mm -hmm. sure, because you you're listening to the very best and you listen to all that classic stuff. But at the same time, I've been to your house and her husband will be listening to something like Duke Ellington and like that kind of thing, Dizzy mm -hmm. and all of them. Mm -hmm. But then you could go and you hear Rock Marinoff and all of that over there, Beethoven, that the, these are the real culturally rich individuals that I'm so glad that I met because they, um, they take the very best. And it really doesn't matter who that was. I wrote a poem once and about young kids dying. And um, Anne Vandergraaff's husband, Hans, had said there was a, an artist named Edward Mook, and he did things about, uh, he dealt with the subject, the death of young people. And um, the, um, disproportionate number of young people. And so I said, the dead precede the dying, mm -hmm. lying face up in the earth, and that ghosts arise to haunt us as they brood in second birth. That, I got that idea sitting out there, one half block from Randolph College, what they call Randolph now, Randolph Macon um, College, in a community that that we used to just drive through to, mm -hmm. to, to, to go there. I mean, you just didn't say, well, I'm going to go out here to T.C. Trotters, or I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And so I like this notion of you take some of what I do, I take some of what you do, and if we don't like some of this other stuff, there is a rebellion against some of this so-called uh, Michigan gospel music that comes down and they call it contemporary gospel. There is a group now that is saying, well, no, that's not gospel. Whatever it is, it isn't gospel. You play gospel music. Do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. And you played it so well. <laughs> and one thing, a rich man like M. W. Thong has said, that's what I want. I want you to play this nice, mellow, rich voice of Mahalia Jackson. That's what I want. I don't want this this other kind of thing. And that's fine, because you're talking about the key word is diversity. See, mm -hmm. once, you, you, once you do that, our problem is we don't have people in these boardrooms where these decisions are made. Other people are making decisions, and they're not a part of the, the whole concept of change. You made a remarkable statement when you were talking about what those kids listen to, what they wear, um, how they do things different, and even how some of the adults do it. You see school teachers now, they do the same thing. They, they leave the building, make like they can't stand that sound, jump into their nice cars, drive out listening to, to the same kind of music that the youngsters are listening to mm -hmm. and liking that music. Mm -hmm. You're not well, I, I think music uh, has a great potential for bringing people together. Because I went to that concert Sunday, one voice from Haiti. Yeah. And it had church, black churches and white churches, you know, St. John's. 
um, and the, the um, elder younger was uh, mm -hmm. working with it, and he said that um, we have different styles and we have you know different things, but it doesn't mean we can't appreciate mm -hmm. you know uh, each other's styles, mm -hmm. and it, it was a great feeling of. of are people getting together even though they were all doing That's the man at Wingfield, I think, to New Pasture. Younger. younger. He was it's very Stacey flamboyant yeah. uh, mm -hmm. young uh, uh, man. And he and, and the minister from St. John's, one of our ministers, um, Diane V, they were co-hosting it. Mm -hmm. and, um, so they, it, it was Where was it? It was at E.C. Glass. Yeah. And the place was packed. And mm -hmm. we raised money for Haiti. But what you were doing, what I can see, what, what it, you were bringing your people together. I mean, that was a bringing community together right, through right. what you were doing, mm -hmm. and um, it, it's wonderful. See, the really community didn't community. know anything about what was happening, what was going on, anything, unless somebody told them to. It was a little gossip thing or whatever. And Jet Magazine and Afro, that was a representative of other places or whatever. Mm -hmm. You didn't know what Court Street was going to have. You didn't know what Jackson Street was going to have, unless you heard it somewhere and somebody said, hey, they got a meeting going on over here. So I just broadcasted it. I didn't have nothing else to do. <laughs> and and that's yeah. a, you remember that. Mm -hmm. um, a lad would come on. It would always be lad and his voice because he was articulate and wasn't mumbling through words and expressions and everything. And he would announce, take maybe seven or eight minutes at a time and just announce, this is what's going to be happening at 8th Street. This is what they're doing at Downing Hill. And then they're doing this at such and such. They're going to have a dinner. Um, here, they're going to have a chitlin strut, and they're going to have fish fry, and they're going to have all that. So that they they bought into that. But I think certain people, like he said, you don't want to castigate folk. But I remember some of the individuals in the community who would meet, and they would say things to them. I'm talking to Lad, Brother Hubbard, John Miller, other pioneers. They would say, okay, you got, you went out and you got these um, these, these advertisements. So what we're going to do is we're going to put them up on the shelf. Now we want you to go and get some more. And if you said, well, what are you all going out here getting? Mm -hmm. They're not getting anything. So then all of a sudden they said, you said, but I had this. I went out and got that. And I got that. I, I brought these yearbooks. Because in the yearbooks, you can see the kids out there, literally, at these major companies and banks and furniture stores and all of that, kids from Dunbar High School doing that, reaching a group. The only thing is that, like I said, if you're not in there where decisions are made, then people can come out and say, well, this is not the way of the future anymore. If you say, wait a minute, if I'm on a commission and you continue to sell Coca-Cola or Pepsi-Cola or whatever it is, then I'm supposed to get my share of that. And I will then work and go out and try to get you some more vendors. But if you just think you can take mine because you own or you manage the thing, and then come in and sit down and say, now let me just tell you how this works. And what happens is like what happened at Roanoke. T.O.Y., do you know the radio station out of Roanoke? Your mm -hmm. son Jay would know. T.O.Y. Uh, one time was just Jumping big time. Roanoke is almost twice as high as Lynchburg. But somehow or other that same philosophy pervaded the, the room or rooms where they make offices those decisions. And they said, well, no, this isn't working. And then you lose that. And it's, it's something, um, it's, there's something sad about the fact. However, there are guys like Lad. And they they super rich guys because they go out here. I'm not saying you're super rich. No, you really but, <laughs> but they go out here and they know how to survive. So you can't go to the park now. The only thing that's changed is it's not like what used to be at Riverside Park. But you can go to Miller Park and if somebody like Lad is there, you can see the difference in the crowd that will come around with that personality. Mm -hmm. Then, if you see Joe Dunks doing that, I'm going to go to this room I eat because he's been working today. I agree.
We have a celebrity in there. Okay, so I, uh, yeah. I'd like you to talk a little bit, you know, because you lived through this period of the civil rights. Right. And okay. knew some of those people on there, including Garnell mm -hmm. and Judy. You, could you talk a little about that? About, um... Well, we have uh, Ronald Wesley up there. We had an office on Park Avenue, of course. You know, I went to him and Mr. Bull West, you know, at, at, at the time. Right, mm -hmm. the, good, the good doctors. And, of course, you know about uh, Charles Mangum and so forth. I guess I think it's him with the briefcase. That's right. <laughs> right, right. Hazel yeah. Bullware right there. Right, um, right. And you knew C.W.C. You knew C.W.C., right. You did speak about him. Mm -hmm. But, um... Did you know the young people who integrated EC Glass? They were a little... The car gloves. Car they were a little, little, bit, little bit ahead yeah. of my time, and I know them now and so forth, yeah. But a lot of the people that are on there, they were, you know, I was just a little kid when they were doing right. their thing, if you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, that's it. But a lot of them on there, you know, I met recently, like uh, Dee Fowler. You know, yeah. Dee and I, I didn't meet her until about, about 10 years ago. I didn't know her back in the day, you know, but I know her now and her efforts with the uh, Hunt Branch and so forth. But anyway, so like, uh, like I said, all of, those, all of those folks on there, I knew them one way or another. I just knew them, but didn't know them personally. But they were older, and they you, were you old, remember right. um, the wait-in at Miller, Miller Park School? Because those were youngsters. I remember that because of the fact that at the time I was going to uh, day camp at uh -huh. uh, Hunt and Y, and we used the Jefferson Pool every summer. And this particular summer, they said that we couldn't use the pool at Jefferson because they've been closed because of an integration issue. And I was so disappointed with the fact. In fact, everybody who went there, they were looking forward. Swimming was one of the big things at the Hunt Branch. So Mr. Walker and all of them found another pool for us to swim in because they had that issue with that, which was the uh, the one out there in Boonesboro. Can't think of the name. Out there by where the uh, hospice center. Uh, at Lodge of the Fishermen. Lodge of the Fishermen. That's where we went. So we went and swam out there. Oh, you were one of those? I was one of those that went and swam Well, Beth we Cosby had the writing that when they did that, mm -hmm. that some of the, because the white folk were using that pool, uh -huh. and they complained because the black children were coming, right, and right. would call him up and asked if he could, they would drain the pool after the black kids had been there. That's a shame. Can you believe it? That's a shame. You know, a lot of stuff you just could not believe. Without don't believe that really happened. Days. But I, I remember that happening because I was just I was just 11, 10, 11 years old. But I was only remembering the fact that like we couldn't go to the pool. What, what was the problem, you know? And they drained it. And as of course now, you know, the Jefferson Pool is nothing but a blank field right there. Yeah, they they bulldozed that. There are pictures of it on the uh, website. On, on the your Lynchburg, website? No, on the Lynchburg History website. Oh, okay. Yeah, right, right, on the, on the old pool and so forth, which bring back memories out there, right down from where the projects are now. Now the Hunt and Why, I think, I don't think know if it's on there, but um, mm -hmm. was that the Hunt and Why on 12th Street? Or that's was the one at 12th and Taylor. 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 That's the only one that we knew about. Because <laughs> yeah. there was one before that, I saw that on, uh, on the website that was on Park Avenue. It was, uh, it was right there in front of the water plant, if I'm not yes. mistaken. Right yeah. there at Park Avenue and Taylor. Mm -hmm. Right, right. That's before they built a new one. In, uh, in 57, the new one. In 57. <laughs> right, but, and yeah. that was when that was built. And you used yep. to go there as a child. And I was there as a child. And we all went to Camp Bobby. That was the big thing. You know, went to Camp Bobby, which was uh, after all of the other kids went to Camp Bobby. We were the last people that went to Camp Bobby, which usually ended up in August. And then we had, a, uh, you know, all the rifle shooting and the archery shooting and so forth. Now I've got pictures of that on my website. Oh, you do? Yeah, the archery and the building crafts and everything like that and so forth. But that was a, that was a big thing back then. You go to Camp Bobby and you, your parents got rid of you for two weeks, you know. <laughs> well, I remember because my kids went there too. Mm -hmm. And of course they went to the, because the bodies the were se segregated there. Mm -hmm. And that was the, only, the black one and, and my yeah, kids went away. That was the only time that I had been away from home for a little mm -hmm. time in my entire life, you know. The parents' visitation day, they had that. I couldn't wait for that. But you know, parents could drive down. The, the Camp Bobby is in, uh, it's down in uh, Mecklenburg County. It's about 80 miles from here. And I found it recently. Oh, you, you know, did? I'm a, I'm a, yeah, I'm an I'm a old buff here. I said, I was out riding with it. I said, I'm going to find Camp Bobby where it was. So I went to, to, the, to the ranger station and I asked him. He had never heard of it before. And he said there was some kind of park that was down this road. And he showed it to me. Of course, it's all grown up. And I didn't, oh, wanna, okay. I didn't even want to step outside. I might have stepped on a snake or something. But anyway. It's still there, but they're gonna they're gonna have a they're gonna put a 
some kind of historic marker. Or not historic marker, but they're gonna they're gonna do some kind of inland fish, some something like Smith Island uh -huh. Lake. Uh -huh. It's on Bugs Island Lake. Yeah. And I just had to imagine because it had been forty some years when I've been down there. It's where everything was, but it's it's still there. It's just overgrown. It's like driving through the bushes. Now, I know they had those lodges because, like, it went yeah, they had that. Lodge. Uh, they had the lodge, had the uh, trading post, and everything mm -hmm. like that. You know, that's all gone and torn. I saw some little debris where that used to be, and that was about it. But yeah, I found it recently. That was that made my day. I just drove home back home. <laughs> now, who were the leaders that you, you mentioned? Oh, uh, Langston Walker, Langston Walker, Mr. Langston. Edley. CC, what was CC? CC Moore. CC Moore, right? And all those, those were the big. Were the guys that we used to worship the ground they walked on, kind of a thing, you know. And was it for boys and girls, or just boys? Well, it's just boys, right? Yeah. Just boys that uh, the girls had their Phyllis Weekly. Yeah. Right, and the Phyllis Weekly, and that was great for the girls. Yeah, but we had a good. I mean, the wild was the only thing we used to have, have uh, sleepovers. You know, you get to bring bring your bag and sleep there overnight and so forth. Yeah, but it was great. <laughs> that was one. That, that was in 61, 60, 61, and sixty-two. Right. I was wondering if you could go more into detail on how it all got started, because your experience is so unique. I graduated in 1969 from Delmar High School. I went to Payne School as elementary school, and uh, I have my, my parents were both uh, school teachers. They taught they taught in the uh, Campbell County school system all of their lives, well, most of their lives. And I have one sister who is seven years younger than me who works for the postal service right now. And I was born in Abingdon, Virginia, which is on that hook end of Virginia, <laughs> and then at the opposite end. That's where I was born, but we moved here when I was five. And that's about it. Been here ever since. And I just um, felt the need of the music aspect as far as it was concerned. A lot of the uh, black music was not getting played, it wasn't getting recognized, and you know, like that and so forth. And I just felt that there was a need for somebody to be putting this music up front. Like, you know, all we knew was the Beatles and the Day of Clark Five, but there's people out here like Wilson Pickett and Rita Franklin who needed just as much recognition in this particular area as anybody else. You know, it wasn't the fact that I didn't like Beatles and Day of Clark Five, it was the fact that it was, if you want to listen to them, you tune over here, you listen to Rita Franklin, tune over here. You know, kind of an aspect. You, it's, you have the freedom to listen to this if you want to. But as it was, when I was coming up, you were forced to listen to whatever the radio station played because it was the only one. And if they chose to do Beatles and Dave Clark Five all day long, that's all you had to listen to or else cut your radio off. And that was my whole aspect on life, you might say, you know, dedicated to, you know, putting this music forefront. It's, that's it. <laughs> it's, it's, it's beautiful to just, you know, be able to go into what you love. Right, 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 and that's it. get into it. And you did this all your life. Yeah, I did this all my life, right, that's it. And uh, what I do now is, like I said, I do a music service, and I have my dad's house and so forth. I got a couple of places, you know, I'm doing rental property. And my hobbies are, of course, you can probably guess what my hobby is, collecting old radios. Oh, wow. <laughs> I have uh, 338, last time I counted, radios in my basement. You know, the old crank big trollers, yes, record yes, players. Yes, yes, yes. And I have an extensive uh, record collection, especially 78s. 78, 78s, the old breakable kind. Oh, that's those are my Those are my favorite. I try to, you know, get as much, many of those as I possibly yes, can. Yes, yes. Right, that's it. So I do records and 45s and everything. Oh, wow. And so so um, is it possible maybe to come one day there and, and oh, look you mean at the uh, radio? Uh, yeah, sure. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. and maybe Listen to some of the music. Uh -huh. Oh, I've got all of that in my. I have a little studio back then. I've got all of the radios yes. that you need to. I need to collect and so forth. All of them there. Yes. The old transistors we used to have, yes. you know, and all of those. Yeah, yes. and I've got them all in a neat museum kind of an atmosphere. Where you can, you know, all separate. They're not just piled on each other on shelves and so forth. You know, real oh. neat. Oh. Yeah. Do you have any recording of your radio station? I wish I did. I have I have a brief, about a 15 second segment, actually recorded of WKKD, yes. and that's all that I have. I had a couple of tapes that were lost, 
they were left in a car that I traded, believe it or not. I yes. forgot that they were there. Yes. And I traded cars, and of course they were gone. So I don't know what happened to them. But I had a whole reel-to-reel -reel of my show on WKKD. And I wish that I had those things. But I traded cars and left, <laughs> accidentally left them in the car. And that's what happened to them. And I have a little segment, and that's about it. Yep. Okay, anything else? <laughs> so what happened when the FCC guy came in? You. Uh, you had to close the whole thing? He just came in and said, what you're doing is illegal. And just like anything else, you know, you can't go around robbing banks. You got to stop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, what you're doing on the air is uh, this is not right. You can't do this. So you got to stop. Else is going to be trouble. If he came back and found that I was still broadcasting, parents, fines, and yes, yes. jail terms, and everything could, could happen. He just gave me a warning. Yes. And I heed my warnings accurately, you know. <laughs> Yeah, that's about it. But it was just a coincidence that at that same time, that particular radio station was getting ready to, you know, was, was changing format and decided to experiment with the black format and hired me. So that was just a luck of the draw. Yes. You know? Do you have any stories you would like to talk about, you know, things that were very interesting you always remember? from your uh, radio station time? Well, not particularly, you know. <laughs> of course, they, you know, a teacher would give me the attention and I wouldn't, I didn't have to take it because they knew I had to go home and cut the station on, so they would <laughs> levy it <laughs> and so forth. Also, uh, we had a little band, I can tell you about that. We had a, yes. little, a little group, a little musical group. We'd go around, me and Perry, Perry Smith, Milburn Magnuson and all. We called ourselves the Virginia Wolves. Yes. And we used to play different places and so forth. And we played at the um, Paramount Theater, which is where the, um, which is downtown where the Holiday Inn Select is now. And we played there on Saturday morning. And we have a tape of the band playing on the oh, air. Oh, wow. And coincident, ironically, the station that turned me in to the FCC was the station that was sponsoring my, that band. Yes. But this was like before I started the station. This was about a couple of months before I was on there, so mm -hmm. I'm on there, and we end up trying to sing My Girl. And, and you have and you have the tape on. of that one? I have the tape on, it's, it's on my website. Oh, mm -hmm. what is the name of your website? It's uh, www.djmadlad.com, yeah, oh. djmadlad.com, and I got all kinds of uh, old Dunbar class reunions, and yes. I've got a, I've got the complete story in case you've missed the WKKD story or whatever. You just click on WKKD. I got the whole story printed out, plus two pictures of me actually broadcasting, mm -hmm. right on that particular site. I've got a lot of the bands on there, the uh, Visitones, Rockin' Rhythms, the Jivers. I've got old pictures of them, you know, that were donated and that I scanned from different uh, members of the bands that are still here in Lynchburg. Yes, yes. Right. Did you play in the band yourself? Yeah, I played keyboards. Oh, you played keyboards? <laughs> yeah, I played, I played keyboards. And oh. I, uh, in fact, I'm on one of the songs that are, if you go to my site and click on the bands, and you click on the banner on the Virginia Woods, you can hear me, uh, us trying to sing My Girl by The Temptations. It's terrible, but it's us. <laughs> yeah. And you were 15 years old at that time. Yeah, around that time, that's right. Uh -huh. Yeah. It's so interesting. Yeah. Now, is there anything else you want to talk about? That's why I didn't listen to the stage. Yeah. 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 The only thing he didn't mention was his DeLorean. He was talking about these cars. Yeah. You remember the DeLorean? Oh, yeah, it was such a sort of unusual car. It was a great car. And it was. Did huge. you watch Back to the Future? The car with yes, the doors and the yes, so that was, and you have I got a deal on one. I still have it. I got a deal oh, on yeah. one back. I've had it since 84. It ain't running. <laughs> it's not running? No, nope, just, like just like the picture. You, mm -hmm. <laughs> See, this is what I'm talking about. Here's a full page ad for Shoals. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. As Bert Shoal. Right. And um, then. Um, Mm -hmm. Lance so class. That's in the Dunbar. This is um, in the Dunbar. Uh huh. Yeah. Can I? Can See, I? This is just like anything else. It's just like advertisement. You know where what, you. Um, you want? You want? You want you to hold it now. Okay. See, it's advertisement, just like any other kind of advertisement. You want to, um, you know, they just, you just bring some representatives from the from the students just come in and take pictures, and they would sell these ads to help finance the yearbook, which is just like radio station advertising. This would be like forty five dollars, maybe the whole page would be ninety or something like that. Now see this. This is a beautiful 
full page um, ad that said McPherson poet and um, Susan um, Waters at Pepsi Cola Bottling Company. And uh, that's what I meant when I was trying to make the, make the point that um, people like Ladd would go out and get these contracts. Mm -hmm. Then what they were supposed to do, because that's what they were doing with the others, and they would say, okay, you make X number of monies because you have to bring this in. They said, no, we got this. We've been having this for a while. You go out and get somebody new. And you said, why would you go out there? And all of us go out there and try to find some new merchants and everything. Mm -hmm. It's that robber baron concept. Yep. And um, I should have brought my, I have the Crest 1969 yearbook, which is from EC Glass. You should see they have about three times the advertisement in the back. I wonder why. This is a picture of um, what do you think? <laughs> Robert Goins. <laughs> oh, no, you're not going to show it. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. He's sitting in somebody's class. No, here's, here's a better The picture. studious young man. Now, here's a better one. <laughs> After building his very own broadcasting station and beaming in on the local listening area, radio station WJJS FM stepped in and gave him a job. He is disc jockey of a rock and roll show and is known as the Mad Lad. And that picture, let her see that. That is a great picture there. That's his graduating class from, mm -hmm. uh, from Dunbar. Yeah, those were the days right there. <laughs> yep. I, I can say this in conclusion about this. I really, really did uh, enjoy the part where you were talking about many things. But when you were talking about how um, you were in the right place at the right time, when Charles Mangum, Mangum ended up being the state president of the um, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, and for 20 consecutive years, until he got sick, he went to the National uh, Convention of the um, NAACP and used some of these very merchants here that you all have to get. You, Brother Albert, John Miller, and two or three other personalities, and they have to fund um, some of our going um, to a place like that. That's a part that we cannot forget. Mandelman had told me that had it not been for that break that he got in 1970 when he ran against Mr. C. Well, he wasn't just running against Mr. C, but he, he's a bold wear, and C were running, but so were Leighton Dodd and um, Elliot Shule and some others, um, Dr. Carol Lippert, a, a, a really, really powerful group of political personalities who ran. But Chuck said that if it had not been for the exposure that you especially gave him, he was going to move his family to D.C. where he had gone to a law school at Howard University. We would have lost all that. How about that? I didn't know that. Yeah. I didn't know that. And um, I mean, we would have lost it. And so um, sometimes people have to tell you thank you for doing something and being a pioneer and a, a way maker and a boy. You said you started at 15, 16, 17 years old and you got your own little um, uh, operation. But I never thought that it was anything small. Maybe it's because, as I said, my proximity to you. I could cut you on and you sounded right now like the major radio um, stations here just as clear and my kids religiously would come home. <laughs> Cause plus they told people we know him. He's out of there. <laughs> you know. And that's that's um that's wonderful. I'm glad I know you Dad. Thank you very much, Ms. Stamps. I appreciate that good <laughs> <laughs> All right.